to the Free Speech Union is launching a hotline for anyone arrested or contacted by the police uh, under Scotland's hate crime law. The group, which campaigns for freedom of speech, said it's attracted 1,000 new Scottish members in recent weeks as the row over the new law intensifies. I'm pleased to say I'm joined now by Stephen O'Grady from the Spe uh, Free Speech Union. Stephen, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Congratulations on the new members, I suppose. Um, but the reason that the, you've got these new members, slightly worrying. It is. It's very concerning. And clearly people are coming to us because they're, they're uncertain of where they stand. They're uncertain of the, the consequences of this new law and how it may affect them. And uh, we've had a lot of questions from people as well asking how they're meant to govern their own behaviour in light of the, the, the changes and so on. So I suppose before when we were covering this, before it actually came in on April the 1st, there were a lot of talk about how everything would be investigated and comedians would be gone after and you can yeah. some lyric might uh, trigger things. That's not the world we're living in right now, though, is it? No, and it seems curious. Um, Police Scotland seems to be departing from their own guidance on this, that um, up until the 1st of April, they had their, their long-standing hate crime national guidance in which they said that anything w should be investigated based purely on the perception of a complainant. If they perceive malice or ill will behind something that somebody has said, they said that they will record it and they will investigate it. We now hear that Hamza Youssef has been complained about thousands of times, so much so that they, they have a script for their call centre workers at Police Scotland, where they're specifically told that there is no ill will or malice behind things that Hamza Youssef has been saying so they can switch the complaints off. So there's no consistency in the way in which they're approaching yeah. it. And uh, it's, it's all what they are delivering is very different to what they've promised. So the problem with that, then, is you've, you've got a law that it's very difficult to understand what it is. So as a citizen, as a law-abiding citizen, how do you work out whether you're about to break that law or not? Well, it's incredibly difficult for people to do this, and a lot of it also, given the, the impact of perception-based reporting, the test in the law is what a reasonable person would consider, and I think most of us would consider ourselves reasonable. The question is, the reasonable person making the decision there could be Police Scotland yeah. determining whether to make an arrest. Ultimately, it would be a jury, 15 in Scotland, people picked at random from the electoral register, and I have some confidence that presented with a set of facts, a jury would likely reach the right decision. But until then, there's an entire process that people would have to go through. The, the police make a decision to arrest them. They could then, if they've said something online, they have their, their, their house searched because this is a power under the law. They can seize electronic devices, so they come out with hard drives and evidence bags for the neighbours to see all the conclusions that people could draw from that sort of thing. If they're a journalist or, or an activist, their, their laptop that's been seized like that, it's a tool of the trade. It stops them from being able to, to continue what they're doing. They're may not be able to replace it while the police hold on to it for months and months. And overall, the process becomes the punishment then as well. So it's not just about the effect of the law if a prosecution is seen to fruition. It's also as we go through, and eventually people will start just inhibiting their own behaviour because they're unsure of what they're allowed to say, unsure of what they can do. And the simple solution is just to keep quiet. Yeah, I love the fact that you say we think we're uh, reasonable. So do unreasonable people. That's the problem, isn't it? <laughs> so, so Scotland's hate crime law is apparently already affecting academic freedom. And to discuss this, I'm joined now by Romina Frohar, who's written about this in The Spectator. Thank you very much for joining us. So uh, what's your take on how it's impacting academic freedoms? Thank you for having me. I think it's really causing everyone to self-censor at this point. It's not just... Um, because it's not clear and we don't know uh, what we can say. We don't know what we can't say. So um, it's a law that uh, encourages self-censorship. Yeah. And what kind of uh, examples of this have you, have you noticed? Do you know anyone in academia who's reporting this? Um, yes. Like in the corners, we've been talking to each other. And um, I have colleagues who also have raised concern about this. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's something that people are afraid of expressing out loud. And, um, yeah, it's a, I, well, I think that's the reason I wrote about it, because uh, we shouldn't be afraid of what we are about to say, especially when it's in academia. We have to be able to uh, freely express what we are thinking, and then that's how we learn. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like you're describing a situation where you'll never be able to attack from both sides an argument with full academic rigour, because at least one of those two sides will be seen as problematic. Yes, and um, 
you know, we do presentations. Um, there are, you know, uh, in any classroom, I'm sure there are discussions and um, even the lecturer even wants to present different uh, points of views. I mean, how is this possible? Anybody would be, is, is, there's a possibility that for anyone to be insulted and uh, offended. So... Mm. What all of us are going to be reported? We we spoke <laughs> uh, with Stephen about the the issue of uh, clarity. The problem is it's such an ambiguous law that it's very difficult to know if you're breaking it. Would that help you if there was a any way of actually knowing where a defining line would be? Well, I'm personally against regulating speech, but um, okay, if they want to give us some sort of direction and um, on how to write and express ourselves i mean it is a still a violation of free speech you know it's it, yeah. it, it, it's very it's they, it's difficult to work with especially in academia you should you yeah, should they'd, have to be they'd have to be have to know how to do it to an academic level as well, which would be interesting. Stephen, what's your thoughts on this? I mean, have you had anyone approach you from academia? We've had some members raising concerns about, in particular, the uh, so-called third-party reporting centres that they've set up in Scotland. These are um, what are colloquially termed snitching stations, where people can come in with their, their concerns about free speech. And uh, we may have heard of the one in the, in the Glasgow sex shop, and there's one on a, a mushroom farm in the borders. But more concerningly, there are some of these snitching stations at Scottish universities. So that means that people at these universities will know that there is an office down the corridor where if somebody takes exception to something they've said, they can go in there, drop them in, and they will then be subjected to the police investigation process, which, as we know, Police Scotland have said they will investigate every complaint. So that must have an incredible chilling effect on speech in universities like that. And, yeah. uh, and also uh, gets rid of the excuse of why you need to go to the sex shop because otherwise you'd have to nip down there to report it but there's already one on campus exactly just exactly. ruined your weekend i suppose um so this hotline that you've set up how's yes. that working well, we have uh, an arrangement in place with uh, Levy and McRae, who are a, a leading Scottish criminal law firm, and uh, this is designed so that people who do find themselves in difficulty with the police, and that could be either an arrest, or it could be, which is more common in these sorts of cases, um, an invitation to an interview under caution down at the station, they're able to call this hotline, will consider the case, assess that it is a, a legitimate free speech issue that's, that's in play here, and then... Uh, the lawyers will uh, will represent them. So is there something that someone could say, something that is truly offensive, that you then wouldn't represent? <laughs> We do, as an organisation, we have a, a statement of values, basically, that um, we will defend people for um, the, exercising their right to free speech within the confines of the law, that we're not going to... The, ah, the, the, the problem is, <laughs> your motto right there, within the confines of the law, gets scuppered by the fact there's now a law that says you can't even say that. Well, we're, we're operating along two prongs on, on that particular one. First of all, it's our contention that if the law were properly enforced, that uh, we would be able to provide a robust defence to people, for example, gender-critical feminists or, or people expressing legitimate political views on things. What we're, what we're talking about here is uh, fascists advocating for genocide or something like that would, would fall beyond the sort of thing yeah. that we would be, be willing to represent. But at the same time, that is the law as it is. There's another sort of prong to the attack here, which is that we lobby to have the law changed where it, it doesn't make sense. And in cases like this, we've fought against the, the, the Hate Crime Act in Scotland. And there, there are other similar things in, in England and Wales and the, the UK wide that we campaign against. Uh, and Romina, can I ask you about the, from the point of view of academia, this uh, helpline that you could, a hotline that you could call, would that help? Or do you think there'd be a stigma associated with even making the call? Um, I think it's very helpful. I think it's very helpful because I'm sure that um, people, you know, will be reported. I mean, in this climate, victim who is, is encouraged, right? Mm. Everybody wants to be a victim. So uh, especially in academia. And so, yes, I think it's very helpful. And um, when academics are reported, they can use this um, service.
OK, thank you for that, Ramina Froha. Um, it does make me think, like, I, I'd never want to be the one to fall down the slippery slope of saying, oh, you can't do anything these days. It's so tempting to do that. But when uh, policy comes after academia, <laughs> that's worrying, isn't it? Because that's where a lot of important free thought actually happens. It is incredibly concerning. Of course, it's probably fair to, to observe as well that a lot of the thinking which underpins the sort of thing originated in academia in the first place, unfortunately, you know, with postmodernism and and uh, the, the culture of grievances, microaggressions, all of that, it's based on COD scholarship that has now become a wide, widely accepted part of, of political thinking, if not broader social thinking. So it originated there. But yes, it is, it is unfortunate because we rely on our universities as the, the institutions of knowledge. It's where knowledge is passed on. It's where it's manufactured, whether, where it's furthered. And that simply can't take place outside of uh, an atmosphere of free inquiry. I'm surprised we got this far, because it always seemed that fundamentally the idea of judging something based on how the recipient of it feels can be un unplayable. It's an infinite number of emotions that someone could have. Anyone could be offended by anything. I could pretend to take offence to the next sentence you say. So surely that's no way to judge things. No. And no. yet it's, it does seem to be going further than I thought it would. Well, it is. It's this sort of idea of it's solipsism writ large, really, with, with, with people who, who think that their, their own perception, their own thoughts about the world equate to reality necessarily. And it is. It's wide open to abuse. We saw a case this weekend of an old age pensioner in, in Scotland who was arrested. This isn't under the new hate speech law. This is under existing laws. Um, it was in the context of a long-standing acrimonious neighbour dispute but the neighbour knew that by ringing the police and saying that this person had said something hateful about her and it was uh, uh, what she said is disputed that this person would then be visited by the police and subject to the, the process there. so it's wide open to abuse whether it be something malicious like that or I have no doubt that there will be some people who sincerely feel hurt, and they do. If you disagree with them, they will take it not just as a, a, a normal disagreement, they will take it as a personal affront and a, a threat to their existence, but they will then use that, even in sincerity, and turn it against you, and you can be subjected to these sorts of things. It's a very unfortunate place to be. I'm sure you will get many of them as well. If I were you, I'd get to know some good lawyers. Oh, you already have. That's good news. <laughs> yes. uh, thank you very much for joining us, Stephen. Brilliant. Thank you for having me. Thank you.